Billy Lair by Keith Waterhouse, Chapter 2. The rune urns of Strad Orton, Man of the Girls, written in the south, Horton Neckle, one morning when there was nothing much doing, couldn't result sturdy buildings of honest native stone, gleaming cobbled streets and that brackish air which gives this corner of Yorkshire its own special piquancy. Man of the Dales put piquancy in italics, not me. My number one thinking offered featured long sessions with Man of the Dales in whatever pub boys on the Echo used, and there I put him straight on his facts. The cobbled streets, gleaming or otherwise, have long since been ripped up with the tram lines and relined with concrete slabs or tarmacadam. Gleaming tarmacadam, I would grant him. Stabbing him in the chest with a stocky briar, which this particular role I affected. The brackish air was I no authority on, except to say when the wind was in a certain direction, it smelled of burning paint. As for the honest native stone, our main street, Moorgate was, despite the lying reminiscences of old men like Councillor Duxbury, who remembered sheep shops where the Excel disc bar now stands, exactly like any other high street in Great Britain. Wolbus looked like Wolbus, the Audion looked like the Audion, and the Stradorton Echoes or Novice, which Man of the Dales must have seen, looked like a public lavatory in an honest native white tile. I had a fairly passionate set piece all worked out on the subject of rugged Yorkshire towns and their rugged neon signs and their rugged plate glass and plastic sh shop rooms. But so far, Norman had given me the opportunity to start up on a theme. Dark satanic mills I can put up with, I would say, pushing my tobacco pouch along the bar counter. They're part of the picture, but... When it comes to dark satanic power stations, Dark satanic housing estates and dark satanic tea shops. Not the trouble with you, youngsters, said Man of the Dales, propping his leather patched elbows on the seasoned bar. You want progress, but you want all the Yorkshire tradition as well. You can't have both. I want progress, I retorted, making with the buyer, but I want Yorkshire tradition of progress. Ooh, that's good. Can I use that? said Man of the Dales. Anyway, satanic or not. It was the usual Saturday morning down in town. Fat women rolling along on their bad feet like toy clams in pudding basins. The grey-faced men reviewing the sporting pinks. Along Market Street where the new class fronted shops spilled out their sagging lengths of plywood and emollient. There were still the old-fashioned stalls lying in the gutter with small rotten apples and purple tissue paper. The men shouted, Do I ask fifteen bob? Do ask twelve, Natana. I do not. I do not ask you for ten, Bob. I do not ask you for three half crowns. Give me five, Bob. Five, Bob. Five, Bob. Five, Bob. Frowning women, their black scratched handbags crammed with half digested grievances, pushed through the vegetable stalls to the steps of the rates office. Of Market Street, there was a gladly called St. Bottle's Passage, the centre of most of Stradorton's ready money betting. Besides the bookie shops, the stinking urinal, the sly chemist with red rubber gloves and big sex hooks in the window, and the obscure one-man businesses mooning behind the dark doorways, it was a pub, a dyer's, and cleaners, and Shadrach and Duxbury's tasteful funerals. Many were the jokes about St. Bottle and his passage, but even more those about the dyer's and the undertaker's. The exterior of Shadrachs, where I now paused to take my traditional deep breath, <coughs> showed a conflict of personalities between young Shadrach and old Duxbury, the two partners. Young Shadrach, taking advantage of Duxbury's only trip abroad, a reciprocal visit by the town council to Lyon, described by a man of the Dales as the Stradorton of France, had pulled out the Dickensian windows, bottle glass and all, and substituted modern plate glass and a shop sign of rare stainless steel lettering. Thus another piece of old straddle and bit the dust, and the new effect was a chip shop on a suburban housing estate. Councillor Duxbury had returned only just in time to salve the old window dressing from the wreckage, and this remained, a smudgy sign by stamp reading, tasteful funerals, night or day service which was my other friend colleague Arthur had said 
needed only an exclamation mark in brackets to complete it, and a piece of purple cloth on which they deposited a white vase, the shape of a lead weight, inscribed with the memory of a certain Josiah Allroyd. The reason Josiah's Allroyd's vase was in Shadrach's window, and not on the corporation cemetery, was that his name had been misspelled, and the family had not unreasonably refused to accept the goods ordered. The Allroyd vase always served to remind me of a ghastly error with some coffin nameplates in which I'd been involved, a business that was far from finished yet, and it was with this thought, uppermost in a fairly crowded mind, ninety minutes late, I entered Chadrack and Duxbury's. The shop bell rang, and behaving exactly like a Pavlov dog, Sam got up and relying elaborately to put on his coat. Must be going home to ambush has come, he said. I ignored and addressed Arthur. His bugger lugs in. I jerked my head towards Shadrach's door. Just come in this minute, said Arthur. You can see we're in the bog. I hissed with relief <coughs> and flopped down on a desk between Stamp and Arthur. Every day, sitting tensed at the front of the bus, pushing with my hands to make it faster, I had this race to the office with Shadrach. Ducks really didn't matter. He never came rolling to in until eleven, and in any case, he was so old he could never remember who worked for him. It was Shadrach, with his little notebooks and the propelling pencil rattling against his teeth who gave all the trouble. It's been noticed that you were half an hour late again this morning. He always said, it's been noticed. It's been noticed you haven't sent those accounts up yet. I'm off to tell him you came in. Not time you came in, sniggered Stamp, and I was obliged to murmur, you do. The passing acknowledgement of his feeble jest. Stamp called himself a clerk, and did not go very much beyond jokes of the Mary Rose sat on the pin Mary Rose variety. He now started on his morning performance. Eh, hey, that tart on the telly last night, when she bent over about with that piano. Cool. It was the first duty of Arthur and myself to knit this quietly in the bud. What make? Arthur said innocently. What make what? What make was the piano? Stamp sneered. Oh, ha, ha. Some say good old Arthur. And we got down to our work, what there was of it. Shadrach and Duxbury's was dull and comfortable as offices go. It was done throughout in sleepy chocolate woodwork, which Shadrach, dreaming of pine wood desks and finished wallpapers, had not yet got his hands on. Our task was to do the letters, make up the funeral account, run the errands and greet prospective customers with a suitably gloomy expression before shoving them off to Shadrach. September was a quiet month, and Saturday was a quiet morning. We all had our own pursuits to work on. Stamp, head on one side, tongue cocked out the corner of his mouth, spent most of his time making inky poses for the youth club. Have you paid your subs? If not, why not? Arthur and I would sit around trying to write songs together, or sometimes I would tingle with the two schools at Grabinster. You couldn't see what make it was. She was bending too far over it, Stamp said at last. I did not look at him, but I knew he was describing the bosom with his hands. Penny's dropped, Arthur said. Penny Farthy, more like, I said. It's been an interest while he thought that one up. Write that one down, said Arthur. Joke over, said Stamp. There was nothing in the entry. I got the two schools at Greitminster out of my desk and stared vacantly at what I had written of my 34,000 words. I say, Weed, aren't you a new bug? <coughs> Sammy turned to greet the tall, freckle-faced boy who walked across the quad towards him. Sammy's second name was appropriate. The face of this sturdy young fellow was as brown as a berry. The Fisher, William Fisher. The two spills at Grippenstar by William Fisher. William L. Fisher. William L. Fisher. To school Sammy by W. L. P. Fisher. Two schools at Grippenstar. A Sammy Brown story by W. L. P. Fisher. Sammy Brown Omnibus, W. Lashwood Fisher, W. De L. Fisher. I looked at it for some time, thought, William Fisher, his life and times. But I did not write it down. Then put the paper back in the drawer. The four chunky calendars under my pillow hurt my chest when I leaned forward over the desk. I began thinking of Danny Boone and the letter I had to write to him. About Shadrach and the letter I had better write to him. I've got something unpleasant to say to our Mr. Shadrach this morning, I said to my mother. 
You've got something unpleasant to say to our Mr. Shadrack this morning, repeated Arthur, dropping into the Mr. Bones and Mr. Jones routine, in which we conducted most of our exchanges. I decided not to tell Arthur just yet about the London business, but to while half an hour away in the usual manner. Anything I say to Mr. Shadrack would be pleasant, I said. Can we leave the undertakers? Arthur said. Tell me, Mr. Crabtree, what are the Poles doing in Russia? I don't know, Mr. Fisher. What are the Poles doing in Russia? Holding up the telegraph wire, same as ever else. That's not what the ladies and gentlemen have come to hear. I jumped to my feet, clutching my room on my desk. Have a care, Mr. Crabtree. I'll buy this rod and it'll be curtains for you. Why so, Mr. Fisher? It's a curtain rod. I don't wish to know that. Stamp plodding in. Same here. It's got whiskers on it. That one. We had explained to him fifty times over that this was the whole bloody point, but the idea would not sink in. He always let stamp to his own jokes. If a barber shaves a barber, he talks. Arthur and I, deadpan, said, Who? Oh. Joke over, said stamp weakly. He went back to the post he was doing for a pea and pie supper out treadmill where Arthur started typing out a new song we had written. I got going on letter. Dear Mr. Boone, my thanks for your letter of September 2nd. Dear Mr. Boone, yes, I should be delighted to come to London. Dear Mr. Boone, I'll be in London next Saturday. The idea of being in London next Saturday, put down on paper and staring me in the face, filled my bowels with a quick rush in terror. For as long as I can remember, I've been enjoying rich clubs and number one thinking about London, coughing my way through the fog of the odd man out club. Chelsea with its chess tables and friendly intelligent girls. I was joint editor with the smiling jock on Sonolu, a Nigerian student of the club's sensational war sheet, modelled somewhat on the lines of the Ambrosia Times Epica. I would live in the studio high over the embankment, sometimes with a girl called Dan, a Londoner herself, as vivacious, vivacious as they come, but more often with Liz. Not Liz as she actually existed but touched up with the number one ponytail to become my collaborator on a play for a theatre in the round. Sometimes I could see myself starving on the embankment, a tramp poet, and now sitting at my desk, the idea of actually starving on the embankment suddenly presented it to me. I switched over to the number two thinking with the grinding of the points inside my stomach, and there I was feeling for the actual pangs of hunger and counting the hot pennies in my pocket. Five shillings left. One egg and chips leaves three and nine. Dossed down at Routon House, two and nine. Evening paper, two pence up in it. Breakfast at Dana, call it two bob. Two bob, two bob. I do not ask for ten bob, ladies. I do not ask for your three up crowns. Give me two bob, two bob, two bob, two bob. And back I was in the number one, the poet's stall holder of Petticoat Lane. The doorbell tinkles, and we got all our funeral purses. But it was nobody. Only Councillor Duxbury. He crossed the floor to his own office with an old man's shuffle, putting all his thoughts into the grip of his stick and the pattern of the faded, broken lino. A thick, good coat sat heavily on his bald back, and there were enamelled medallions on his watch chain. At the door of his room he half-turned, moving his whole body like an old robot, and muttered, "'Morning, lads.' We counted half dutifully, half ironically, "'Good morning, Councillor Duxbury.' <laughs> and directly the door was closed began an imitation of it. It's Councillor Duxbury, lad. Councillor Duxbury. I wouldn't call Lord Airwood, mister, would the Councillor, that's my title, now think on. I'm just about raped, said Arthur in broad dialect. The word was one we'd made up to use in Yorkshire dialect routine. We took the Michael out of Councillor Duxbury and people like him. Duxbury prided himself on his dialect and was practically unintelligible into seasoned Yorkshiremen. That's got more prickly breed here, lad, I said. I am fair scrutinin' oh, I said Arthur. Darman late wit ganglin' iron. Aye. He swung the other half of the routine, which was Councillor Duxbury remembering as he did every birthday in an interview with the Stradot and Echo. Arthur screwed his face into lined old man's wrinkles and said, Course, all this with wheels when I were a lad. And of course I'd knob it one clog to my feet when I came to Stradotton. I said in a wheezy voice. I could get a meat pie and change out a fourpence. I'm gonna box it in power and go home at ten at night. I had to tack a cab home because I only had one cog, said Arthur. Ooh, oh, you, sir, said, resuming my normal voice. Bastard. Bastard, said Stamp automatically. 
Every Saturday, Natter did a club turn down at one of the pubs at Clog Arm Lane near where I lived. It was a comedy act, but not the kind of thing Danny Booby interested in. A slow burning Yorkshire monologue that was drummed up mainly by Arthur and me at these sessions in the office. Arthur was more interested in the singing time. He did a turn at the band with the Roxy twice a week, Wednesdays and Saturdays, trying vainly to get them to play the songs we'd written between us. When my own turn was finished, I would hover over to Roxy to listen to him. But then I was thinking, whisky from one beer to another to catch a promising act that I was thinking of booking. And as for Stamp, he did nothing except loll about in the Roxy, waving his arms about mouthing wood choppers for all when the band played it. So that bint you used to knock out with this morning, he said when Duxbury's routine was over. You what? That bint uh, that always used to be ringing you up. I ran frequently back to the sequence of disasters. Audrey, Peggy, Lil, that bint from Markham. A depression grew inside me as I traced back to almost my school days. When I recognised the depression, I knew he was talking about. I said lightly knowing what was going. What oh, bint for Christ's sake? That scruffy lucky one. Heard uh, always wore that suede coat. I pulled him concerned in my face. Who? Biz? What's her name? Yeah, old Bam Lizzie. Shag like a rattlesnake. Doesn't she? Hasn't got a new coat yet. So Liz was back in town. I like that Liz back in town as though she'd just ridden in on a horse. I toyed with it for a second, so not to think about her. Drive you out of town. City limits. Get out of town, Logan. I'm warning you for the last time. It was a month ago, wasn't she, last left? Only with a chance goodbye, and this time there'd be no postcards. It was the part of the nature to disappear from time to time. And I was proud of her bohemianism, crediting her with soul deep need to get away and straighten out her personality or to find herself or something. But in less romantic moments, I would fall into wondering whether it was tarting around the street with some American airman. That's no real feeling for her, but there was always some kind of pain when she went away. When the pain yielded, nothing. I converted it like an alchemist busy with the seaweed into something approaching the... Where did you see her? I asked. I don't know, walking through family street, said Stump. I think she's got another boyfriend. He's in his nauseating elbow plodding way. I said carefully. Thought she'd uh, gone to cancer or somewhere. Then the first country that came into my head. What's she coming back for then? said Stump. I was trying to find a cautious way of going on with it when Arthur came to the rescue. He'd been handling the switchboard. Never use a preposition to end a sentence with, he said. I haven't told myself I had more friends, or the allies, banded together in some kind of conspiracy against the others. Arthur was one of them. We spoke together mainly in catchphrases, hidden words others couldn't understand. I must ask you not to split it into I said gratefully, in a light, relieved voice. Hear about the bloke who shot the owl, said Arthur. It kept saying to who instead of to whom. Should it be whom's whom instead of who's who? I said not for the first time that week. Even our ordinary conversations were like the soft shoe shuffle routine with which we enlarged our ordinary day. I was perfectly aware that I was stalled and turned back to Sam. Do you speak to her? Speak to her? To whom? Would Bam Lizzie, I said, burning with shame for using the nickname Stamp had given her. No, I just said hello, she was with somebody, he said. I thought it didn't matter. It was my first bit of emotional meat this morning. I was determined to make it matter, to get the pain back inside where it belonged. Who, who was she with? No, oh, no, no, I don't ask people for their autographs. What's up, are you jealous, eh? Eh? You pronounced the word jealous as though it was something you dug up out of the garden, still hot and writhing. The doorbell tinkles again. Shot. Called Arthur softly, getting up, a small woman, all best clothes she had collected together on her body, peered around the door. Is this where do you come to own to it funerals? Arthur walked respectfully over to the counter. I've been in too long shop. I thought he went out to do her. She leaned heavily on the counter, arms folded against it, and began to spell out her name. I got up, stiffly, feeling the candles under my pillow, and the waft of cold air when I separated from my shirt. Off for a slash, I muttered to slump and went downstairs among the cardboard boxes of shrouds and cupping handles. I plotted aimlessly among the reef cards and bales of satin lining, looking for something worth having, and then went into the laboratory. The laboratory at Shadrach's and Duxby's had a little shaving mirror on the door where Shadrach could inspect his boils. More as a matter of routine than anything else, I put my tongue out and looked at it. There were some lumps at the back of my throat I'd never noticed before. 
Twisting the subject of Liz on one side, I've been putting my tongue between my fingers, seeing if the lumps got worse farther down, and wondering if they were the beginning of gingivitis, which stamp, with some justice, a supper the year before. The sharp pain in my chest I located as the edge of the calendar shoved against my ribs. I checked out the bolt on the door again, <coughs> and took out the calendars for under a pullover. They were dogged now, and well-established creases across the envelopes. The top one was addressed to an old woman of the superior, the nunnery down by the canal. I took out the calendar and folded the envelope in four. A surprising bulkiness, I rammed the envelope into my side pocket, where the passion pills were, and held the calendar in my hands. The other three grimly gripped under my arm. There was a brown printed page for each month. The months tore off, and at the bottom of each month was a quotation. I knew some of them by heart. The only riches you'll take to heaven are those you give away. January. Think all you speak, but speak not all you think. February. It takes sixty muscles to frown, but only thirteen to smile. My worst energy. April. I tore off the leaves from my one and dropped them into the laboratory. When I reached October, it's a guide heart that says nail, but a better heart that thinks no. I decided that was not me, time being, pulled the length of rough string that separate chain. As I screwed up pieces of paper swam around in the water, I tried to to count them, trying to walk to include ten pages, in case I'd got one on the floor for Shadrach to find and investigate. The water resumed its own level. To my horror, about half a dozen candle leaves, soggy and still swimming, remained. I was gnawing at my lower lip and checking the signs of panic. Hard, sweaty palms, tingling ankles, like a mechanic servicing a car. I flushed the laboratory again, but there was only a heavy zinking noise of trickling waters the ball cock protested. I perched myself on the side of the scrub seat and waited, staring at the mother superior's calendar. To those who bring sunshine in the lives of others cannot keep it from themselves. November. I could hear Councillor Duxbury clumping about upstairs, aimlessly opening drawers and counting his money. Without much effort, I drifted into Ambrosia, when the Grand Lumery was still limping past the war memorial. The left arms raised in salute. It is often wondered how the left arms salute purely to Ambrosia originated. Counts differ, but the most widely explanation is that the seven men who survived the Battle of Wakefield all, by amazing coincidence, had lost their right arms. It was necessary for them to salute their president. The stairs creaked and my footsteps on the stone floor outside. Somebody rattled the loose knob of the laboratory door. I waited for them to go away, but they gave heavy breathing. We began to start up a tuneless whistling so they would know the booth was engaged. And to backtrack with my recent thoughts to check that I had not been talking to myself. The door rattling continued. Someone in here, I called. I heard the voice of Stamp. What are you doing, man? Writing your will out. It was a candle and Mark Grand would shout up the stairs. Piss off, I shouted. As I would dearly have loved to shout at Gran in the same situation. Stan began pulling at the door. There'd been a key or he'd been peeking through it by now. No righty lucky words at all, he called. I did not reply. Stan began quoting. Gentlemen, you have the future of England in your hands. Last few words of breath was accompanied by a scraping noise on the floor. It was obvious he was jumping up and down trying to peer over the top of the door. Now off, Stan, for Christ's sake, he called. I stood up. The sucky little balls of paper were still in the laboratory, but I did not pull the chain in while Stamp was still there. I picked up the other calendars and the floor where I'd put them and stuck them back inside my pullover, trying not to let the stiff paper crackle. Outside, Stamp began grunting what he imagined to be an imitation man in the throes of constipation. Bet you're reading a mucky book, he said in a hoarse whistle through the door. I let him run along. Bet you are. Bet you're reading a mucky book. He's on him caressing silk, isn't he? And excited by his own feeble images, he began to mouth obscenity through cracks in the deep green door. There was another sound on the stairs, this time the furry padding of long suede shoes, and I can imagine the yellow socks and the chocolate brown gabardines that went with them. I heard the nasal, nosy voice of Shadrach. Haven't we got anything better to do upstairs? Stamp. And Stamp crashing into his voice in second gear to simulate something approaching the foot, saying, Just wait until you're on the toilet, Mr. Shadrach. <laughs> Yes, it's thought so we spend too much time down there. Far too much time, said Shadrach. He picked up at words of the picked up spots. Shadrach was not stock cartoon undertaker. Or he made a good model of the stock cartoons. 
Notably, one concerning the psychiatrist's couch. He was, for a start, only about 25 years old, although grown old with quick experience. Before slight rhubarb, his general approach and demeanour was that of a second car salesman, and he had, in fact, at one time been one in the South. He was in the undertaking business because his old man was in it before him. Old Shadrach had been, so to speak, young Shadrach's first to count. After that, he rarely attended funerals, and were indeed a it difficult in view of the Ari Blaze and the Canary Club Pullover, which, sported being the word, he sported. But he was useful to the firm in that, besides having inherited half of it, he could get round to old ladies. He was a member of most churches in Stradorton, and to my knowledge was a kind carrying a Unitarian, a Baptist, a Methodist, and both high and low church. You better get up into the office, I heard him say to Stamp. I've got to go out. Stamp shoveled up, murmuring in inarticulate civility. I called, Is that you, Mr. Shafnick? He either did not hear or didn't choose to hear, but started fidgeting among the coffin handles just outside the laboratory door. Is that Mr. Shafnick? Yes, there's something that he's waiting to come in there, he said testily. Shan't be a minute, I called in a high monotone of a man hailing down from the attic. I was wondering if I could see you before you go. What? The voice I'd shown was beginning to sound ridiculous. I was wondering if I'd see you before you go out. Shadrach called back. Yes, I've been thinking it's about time we had a little talk. Perched in my cold cell, I wondered miserably what he meant by that, and skimmed quickly through the condensed inventory of things he might know about. Well, I can't see you now, Fisher. I've got to arrange a funeral. You'll have to come back after lunch. Every Saturday afternoon after Burma closed the day, Shadrach started messing about with drawing board he kept in his office. He was trying to design a contemporary coffin. So far I'd not had the nerve to try and interest Councillor Duxbury in the project, the councillor being an old and brass fittings man, but he spent a lot of time drawing streamlined caskets, as he called them, on yellow scratch pads. One thing he had succeeded in doing was fitting out the funeral fleet, including the hearse with a radio system. When there was a funeral, Shadrock was sitting in his office saying, Abel Peter, Abel Peter, or instead of the microphone. So far as I could remember, nobody ever answered it, and I could not think what he would have said if they had, except the vert funeral to Anstall in chapel over. He kept a copy of the loved one in his desk, but only to get ideas. I called, right over Mr. Shadrock. I did not know whether he'd gone back upstairs or whether he was still prowling outside. Not to take chances, I flushed the laboratory again. When the water flowed away, there were two little balls of paper still floating about. I took a thick folded envelope out of my pocket, and my face, disfigured with bad nausea, scooped the two soggy leaves of calendar out of the laboratory. I stuffed them inside the envelope and crammed it into my pocket. Then I unbolted the door. Shadrach was standing immediately behind me, glanced me up and down like a customs officer as I passed. Upstairs, I had his drink at on, waiting to go out for coffee. Before I could speak, Stamp called, Here he is, reading mucky books in Vogue. I reached my own rake up. Stamp shouted, hoarsely so that Shadrach could not get downstairs. Let's have a read. What you got? Lady Chatterley's lover. He dived forward and began scagging me around the stomach. He felt the stiff cannons and below and bellowed in charm. Yes, yes, he's got a mucky book on his jersey. God, dirty old man. I seized his wrist and snapped, take your friggin' mucky hands off my pillow, stupid lucky crow. Give us your mucky book, please stop wheezing as you cloak over where. Arthur was twiddling the door handle impatiently. Are you coming out for coffee? I pulled my cord on. Don't be all day, you do, I want some, said Stump. Get stiffed, I said. Don't take any wooden bodies, Arthur opened the door. Get stiffed, said Stump.